In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Chris Haddad. He runs a $7 million business and he's built up a list of over 300,000 people. It wasn't always like that. He talks about some of the hard times and he even talks about what I should be texting my wife to bring a spark back, not that it's not there already. That and much more coming up right now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I am honored to have Chris Haddad. He's also known as Michael Fiore. He's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. He's a master at conversion and founded Digital Romance Inc., which is a $7 million business and built up a list of over 300,000 people. His alter ego, Michael Fiore, we'll see who shows up today, is an internationally known expert on how to have great relationships in the modern world. He's even appeared on the Rachel Ray Show with his popular texting program. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. I'm happy to be here. You know, it's so rare that I actually do interviews or do put out material under my own name these days that it's it's a little strange. So what should to, I uh, call you today? You can call me Chris, but I'll, okay. I might. I'm, I'm so used to people calling me Michael and calling myself. Like we do a podcast, we do uh, sales videos. I've I've spoken on stage as Michael Fiore before. The mm. only difference between me and him really uh, is that he dresses much better. Uh, he never has a beard, and um, never, my, my huh? wife. Yeah, my wife occasionally says she wishes she were married to Michael Fiore as opposed <laughs> to me. Uh, but I'm like, well, honey, she's, he's kind of a fictional character. So, so does she get texts from Chris or Michael? She has tell, only tell me ever about gotten... one of your, your fun texts. So I was telling oh, a God, few people man, today yeah. that I was interviewing you and they're like, yeah. well, tell me about some of his texts. I'm like, I'll ask him. What was the what one that I, favorites? what was, I mean, God, you know, I don't really, uh, that program is like four years old, so I don't really dig into the texting stuff too much. One of the biggest things we tell people on that though, is to use like, is basically don't text anything that seems like it could come from a 22 year old frat boy. Okay. Right. Cause so many people just text and they go, Hey, what's up? Or how are you? Like, it's all about storytelling. If you go through, by the way, if you go through checks, the romance back, which is what kind of started this business for us. Um, it's a copywriting product. Right? Like all it really is is a copywriting product. All that program is is a $47, you know, 20,000 word product on how to use emotional language, how to, uh, you know, how to use like Im- imagine and believe and things like that, how to tell stories that are, uh, you know, basically create a, a very specific romance novel for the person, all of that kind of stuff. And so there's a lot of stuff in there about like, I mean, I'm trying to remember about the specifics. So but what like, should I text my wife after we're done with this interview? Um, just send her something as simple as, you know, you should text her, mm-hmm. send her what I call an appreciation text. Okay. Right. All you got to do is say, I don't tell you enough, but here's what I fucking love about you. And I just swore. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. And that sounds, that sounds so simple and so cheesy, but nobody gets it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it's so easy to, uh, like all of these women that I get all the time, they're, you know, writing into Michael Fury and they're like, how do I get my husband to pay attention to me? How do I do that? How do I do that? I say, you tell him what you love about him. Right. One, like I told one woman, just just send your, your husband. Um, uh, nothing makes me happier than seeing you seeing you with our son. I'm so happy I chose you to be the fa- the father of my my children. I love you. And it sounds cheesy, right? But nobody gets that stuff. All you get is why didn't you bring home the eggs? Why right. didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And that very negative kind of mind frame mindset, right? Yeah. So just like focusing on what you actually appreciate, like it's and it's so easy not to do that, not to spend a little time just uh, you know appreciating your spouse, appre- or even your friends. I do the same thing with my employees. By the way, I had one employee who used to work for another company in the dating niche, and uh, she was working as our affiliate manager. She moved on to something else, and we got somebody else from the same company actually. And she was talking to somebody and she was saying, yeah, Chris, what what freaked me out about when I first started working for you is you say thank you and share the credit on everything, right? And it's especially kind of sad. That's a, oh, a man, it, bugs the, it bugs the hell out of me because I'm like, you know, we, well, yes, I built this seven million dollar company with a lot of help, yeah. right? Uh, help from people that I hired, help from men- mentors, help from uh, you know affiliates. I mean, you know, if, Trav- if Travis Sago had never mailed my first product, I don't know that I'd be sitting here right yeah. now. So, um, so it, it reminds me of like back during the last political campaign when there was the whole Obama flack about Obama saying you didn't build that. You know, and people were like, you know, Republicans were getting really angry at him and talking about how he's like, you know, saying that entrepreneurs don't pull themselves up by their boots. And I'm like, we do pull ourselves up by our boots, but who gave us the boots in the first place? Right. You got to have boots. Like if there was no Internet, I wouldn't have this business. Right. 
you know, I'll tell you, I mean, if you want, I'll tell you my whole story of how I got here. And it's like a lot of it was luck. A lot of it is just like you happen to be in the right place at the right time yeah. to get things. And it bugs me. The I am market in particular really bugs me. Can you, I can get up on stage and I can be that obnoxious braggart guy who talks about all the money we make and blah, 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 blah. Because that's sometimes what you have to do to sell in that market. I don't like it, though. I don't think it's fundamentally true. You know, the reason I stopped writing I am copy years ago was because it just was it felt like such noxious bullshit to me to be yeah. writing about you know I got this you know the, the character in the sales video who got his Ferrari and has all this other stuff and I'm like in my own journey none of that stuff actually makes you happy you yeah. know right I want to like, dig into yeah. you early on oh, yeah. you know what shaped you but before I do I want to ask you know so I was also talking to someone this morning so what yeah. sparked you where did you get the idea for the text to romance program I was uh, working as a copywriter. Um, you know, I basically about five years ago, I guess, I was still working as a freelance copywriter, um, which meant I was scrapping for work every month. You know, I was getting paid well. I would make at minimum ten thousand dollars for a sales letter. I would sometimes make twenty five for a sales letter at that point because my reputation was good enough. Um, but I was still having to work for other people, and I was kind of miserable. You know, like I, that was a point where I, I started speaking a bit. I'd, I'd spoken at um, Jeff Walker's event. I'd spoken at, I'm not sure if I'd done, I think a bunch of other I stuff. I saw you at Yonix, I think. Yeah, I think I'd gotten on stage at Yonix yeah. and some other stuff like that. And I, But I was still just miserable and I was just like unable to get off my ass and do my own stuff. And I think that I had this weird mental block around creating my own products. Uh, creating either products in the inner in their marketing space or creating products in something else. And I had this mastermind group of a bunch of guys who I still know. Um, I'm not still in that group, but I still know them. And um, I told them at one point, I'm like, you know, I need to just create a product. And I was like, I'm going to create something about a dating product about texting. And I'm going to have it done by the time we get on the phone next week. I'm going to have the whole product done. I'm going to write the sales video by the time we get on the phone next week. What was the mental block? Just because someone may listen, you know, be listening and they have that mental block. What was it and how did you get over it? I'll, I'll talk about this. You know, the, um, I thought you needed permission to be, be successful. Right. So when my wife and I first met, that was like right after I'd started this business and created Michael Fiore and all this other kind of stuff. And she actually asked me, she's like, well, who gave you permission to be a relationship expert? And I'm like, I did. Right. Well, what mm -hmm. makes you a relationship expert? I decided I'm a relationship expert. I'm going to go help people. And I, you know, I was actually talking to one of my employees yesterday and I said, after four years of pretending to be a relationship expert, I think I've actually become one because <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. But, you know, just like the um, the block, I think, is it's so easy when you're not at that point yet. They'll see the people that are successful, They'll see folks like me at this point. Right. And think, oh, I can't do that because I don't speak at a thousand miles an hour and I'm not a great copywriter or I can't do that because I'm not Jeff Walker or I'm not Frank Kern or I'm not any of these guys, you know what they are? They're just regular assholes like everybody else, right? As soon as I started speaking and got behind the curtain and was hanging out with the speakers and things like that, I was like, oh, none of these guys are actually special. Um, David Deutsch is a good friend of mine. He's a great copywriter. You should get him on the phone if you can. Yeah. And uh, somebody was asking, um, they were talking, somebody was talking about me and he, was, he told me, Chris, I was talking to somebody about you, about you, about you, about you. About you. And then they were saying you had a big ego, and I was like, and David was like, no, Chris does not have a big ego. Uh, it's not that you think you're better than other people. It's that you don't automatically assume they're better than you, right? Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of people do that. They assume that everybody else is smarter, better, happier, yeah. whatever, whatever else, and they're not, right? Like success is a combination of hard work and luck. Um, you know, you have to work hard to make sure you're in the right position when the luck comes by, and you have to have your mind in the right place so that when you do get successful, you don't destroy it all. Yeah. Right, because you know you know all the stats about like you know people that win the lottery being broke. Fires. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So tell me about but, early on the the yeah. young Chris. What influenced yeah. you uh, early on? Uh, so young Chris, like when I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, I, I know you mentioned your parents and you mentioned a story about your dad. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, let me see. I, I grew up in Grafton, Massachusetts. I was the dorky younger brother of the quarterback of the football team. You know, uh, I was into theater and things like that and was a total geek with very few friends and uh, had a really hard time connecting to people. I also had extremely bad undiagnosed ADHD for the hmm. first 30 years of my life really? or so. Oh, yeah. So how did and that I still affect you? Uh, in a variety of ways. I was the kid who... Got, I was a C student who would get F's on tests in chemistry class, but got the second highest SAT scores in the school. Wow. Right? Because I couldn't um, 
concentrate. And people, you know, there's a lot of people that think ADHD is BS and whatever else. And I'm like, no, you literally cannot focus now for whatever reason. Um, I think it might be because I was born significantly premature plus some other stuff, but whatever, whatever reason, my brain just works in that particular way. And so, um, honestly, for the first 23 years of my life, I was a very miserable person, partly because of that, partly because my parents uh, did not get along, it would be a nice way of saying it. There was a lot of emotional anger in the house, which is actually what inspired me to create this business, I mm. think, uh, is just seeing how bad relationships can be and seeing how expectations and uh, a, a, a rampant desire for your spouse to be somebody they're not is a really great way to be miserable and have miserable children. Um, and so I grew up in that kind of environment and I was always a pretty smart guy with a lot of potential who could never actually fulfill that potential. And then I went off to college and it was kind of more of the same. My dad died when I was 19 years old. He had a, a cancer followed by a heart attack. Mm. And, of, and of course that sent me into a bit of an emotional spiral and got really numb emotionally for a while. Uh, I was in the middle of college at that point and just um, between the fact that my brain was buzzing at a thousand miles an hour all the time and I couldn't really calm down down and that going on, I was a pretty miserable person. And then I got out of uh, college and I ended up moving to Los Angeles because I wanted to work. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I, I guess what I was, I thought what I was supposed to want to do, I was supposed to want to go to LA and try to be a TV writer. Hmm. That's what I was supposed to want to do. Chris, I want to ask you a quick yeah. question. Yeah. And I'm sorry to hear about your dad. How, okay, did, yeah. you, how did you get over that? Because some people never get quite it. get over that. I mean, at the time, it, how do you don't become obsessed you, with it? Yeah. How do you push through and kind of start your life again? I feel it's just a life changing, hard to hard to get out of a rut when that happens. Um, I, in my in life in general, I've I've gone through a fair. I mean, we all go through suffering. I've gone through a fair amount of it. I mean, everybody has. Um, you just get up and do it. You know, you don't let yourself wallow. You don't let yourself. I mean, I'll talk in a bit if you want about. I've had uh, Lyme disease for the last couple of years. Oh, wow. Right? I got diagnosed with that about two and a half, two years ago, I guess. And I kept getting more and more tired. I kept getting, uh, I couldn't uh, focus. Um, I spoke at uh, one conference down in Santa Barbara and like literally it was all I could do to, to not fall over on stage because I was so dizzy and I wow. couldn't think straight. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to diagnose was, that. How did they figure it out? I went to a billion doctors and I finally went to one who one of my employees recommended who said, okay, well, you might have Epstein-Barr, you might have this, or you might have Lyme disease. And I'm like, there's no way I have Lyme disease. Why would I have that? And it came back super positive. And so I got like, you know, really, really tired and, you know, couldn't think straight. And uh, if I was still freelancing, by the way, when that happened, I would have gone broke, I think. I don't know how I would have possibly continued what I was doing because it was only the fact that we had the business and the business was doing pretty well and I had good people in key positions that meant that I was able to, you know, we actually grew the business very significantly while I was sick, wow. right? And it wasn't because I was working super hard all the time. Um, but yeah, I got diagnosed with that and uh, I kept going to the gym and I kept, uh, you know, going out with friends when I could or I just had friends come over to my house and I kept playing music every day and I kept doing all this other stuff and there's so many people who get diagnosed who just give up. They let, they let their tragedies define who they are. Mm -hmm. Right. And I always say, um, you know, be grateful for your tragedies. They make you who you are because you can look at your tragedies as either. Oh, woe is me. Here's my excuse for not doing anything. Oh, my parents were mean to each other and I had undiagnosed ADHD for 25 years or 30 years. And uh, I got Lyme disease and blah, blah, blah. And here's all my excuses for not being successful and not doing what I want to do with my time. It's bullshit. Right. Like if you know, if you only have one hour a day when you feel good, spend that one hour a day doing something you love. Right. Um, same thing. So when I got sick, I was like, I'm. You know, the first thing I did after I got diagnosed with uh, Lyme disease, I called my my uh, girlfriend at the time. We weren't married yet, and I told her about it, and she was like, Wow, that's weird. That explains why you've been so tired all the time. And uh, then I went to the gym and I deadlifted 400 pounds and broke my deadlift record. Right for me personally. And because I was just so like, no, I'm not going to let this be the thing that destroys me. Uh, and it can. Lyme disease is awful. I know people that can barely get out of bed. I know people that are in wheelchairs. And that can happen. But the best thing you can do is keep trying to push forward and live your life. What so. is the treatment for it? What do they do? Oh, there's a billion. There's, it's, I don't even want to get into a huge debate yeah. on Lyme disease. But um, a lot of antibiotics, a lot of other kinds of stuff. There's, there's a lot of controversy around it and all that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so go way. ahead. You, I interrupted you and you said, I went to L.A., Oh, I went to L.A. and I spent two years uh, kind of trying vaguely to get into the entertainment industry. But honestly, I didn't want it badly enough, hmm. right? Looking at it now, um, 
I was never going to be somebody who wanted to go through all the bullshit that it takes to be a television writer. And even if I did, I don't think it would have made me happy because I'd still be living in L.A. And L.A. kind of sucks, you know, as far as a place to live. Um, I like visiting it. I like going down there. I've got good friends there. I just don't think it's a great place to want to live your life every day. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I just didn't really want it. And then I ended up uh, I worked, I ended up working for a company down there that did, like, digital. It was like some tech company 12 years ago. And they decided to shut down the L.A. office and they uh, – had me, uh, they offered me a deal. You can move to Seattle and have a job, or you can stay in LA and not have a job. And so I said, okay, I guess I'm moving to Seattle. And at that point, you know, I was only making $28,000 a year or something like that. Um, I don't think I, yeah, I think I, I did not make more than 30 grand in a year until I was 28, I think, something like that. Um, and uh, ended up moving to Seattle, and they wanted me to be a project manager, which is hilarious because I'm the least detail-oriented people in the person in the world. So that's not what you hire me for. Um, and that didn't work out, so I ended up getting laid off from that. And then I spent several years being unemployed in Seattle and uh, really not being able to figure out what I should or could be doing with myself yeah. at that point. So what do you point. do during that time when you're unemployed? I did a lot of temp work. I started doing yoga. I got a, fell in love with a girl and then fell out of love with a girl. Um, played in a couple bands and I uh, was generally, spent a lot of time waking up in the morning in my really crappy apartment and uh, laying on the floor and looking at the ceiling and wondering what the hell is going to happen next and not knowing how to go after something, right. right? Not having the language in my brain of where do you get success from? And then eventually I, um, got, I ended up getting a job as a greeting card writer, which was kind of a weird job. Did that for a little for about a year. Was making a whopping twenty four thousand dollars a year at that point, but it only lasted about nine months, I think, before they laid me off from that. And I was just like, man, I was twenty five years old at that point, I think, and couldn't make any money, couldn't keep a job. I'd been fired literally from every job I'd ever had. You know, every time I got a job, I'd either been I'd either been laid off or fired or like you know yelled at for not being able to pay attention, which is a recurrent theme in my life. And uh, had a bit of a breakdown. I was like, what the hell am I going to do? And I ended up going to a career counselor. And she was like, what's your, what's your big, hairy, audacious dream? And my dream, the biggest I could dream at that point in my life was, man, five years from now, I just want to be able to make $40,000 a year as a writer. That was as big as I could dream. Why did you right? stay with writing? What was it about writing that you liked so much? I've just always been good at it. It's easy. You know, I can type at a thousand miles an hour and um, I've just always been a writer in yeah. whatever way. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of acting and other stuff in my life too, but writing's always been my easiest way of communicating. And um, I, don't, I don't think I particularly have like a passion for writing. I used to really uh, beat myself up because I'm like, wow, you should really want to be an author. You should want to write books. You should want to do these other kinds of things. And I don't really have, yeah. I don't really have the great American novel. Yeah. Anymore. What mainstream really... people say writers should do type of, you exactly. don't have that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for me, it's all about, I like writing marketing stuff because it's creative and it's fun and it's interesting and it gets out there and you see an impact right away. I like writing theater stuff. I write plays and things like that occasionally when I'm asked to and those are fun because, you know, you write something and it goes up on stage. You get to see how the audience actually reacts. Right. But anyway, so I was doing all that stuff and then... So the big, hairy, audacious. Oh, yeah. That, that, was, that was as big as I could go at the time. And then I started, um, she, she told me the a whole concept of writing copy at that point. Oh. So she was telling me about how to write copy for, uh, you know, brochures and for banks and for things like that. And so I hung out my shingle and uh, called myself a copywriter, though I had no idea what I was doing. And I spent two and a half years writing corporate BS copy. Um, I wrote like some brochures for Microsoft. I wrote for you know Washington, uh, the, the big big bank in Washington. I think it was Washington Mutual at the time. A bunch of other places. I made very little money. <laughs> I think I made 18 grand that first year on that. Uh, and then over time, I started hearing about uh, you know direct response copywriting. And I remember getting like, you know, can you write a letter like this one from AWAI or something like that? And feeling like, man, this is bullshit. Nobody would, why would anyone, no one would ever read a letter like this after I just read the whole letter, right? <laughs> um, yeah. This can't, this can't possibly work. There's no way that long copy works or anything like that. And then like I started getting emails from Harlan Kilstein and other stuff. And I would end up like talking to people about, man, that's like the dark side of copywriting and blah, blah, blah. No freaking way I'll ever do that, et cetera. 
And then I ended up going to, um, oh, and somewhere in the middle of this, I got hit by a semi-truck. That was fun. I, had, I was in a car at the time. Yeah, so I got in this really bad car wreck and screwed my back up and was uh, popping Vicodin and uh, was in so much pain that I could, you know, uh, barely talk half the time and really? all those other kinds of stuff. Yeah, it sucked. Yeah, I wasn't, wouldn't recommend it. Um, and uh, then I ended up, while I was, had all this back pain, I ended up going to a thing that Harlan Kilstein was doing in LA, no, no, in Vegas called uh, Value Based Copywriting. It was supposed to be about how to like make more money as a copywriter. So I went to that. I was making a little bit of money at the time. So I went to that and uh, spent a couple days with it and was emotionally really in a bad place overall because my back was in so messed up and all this other stuff. And I ended up joining Harlan's um, uh, b -b 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 mentoring group. And within six months, I made $100,000. And you know Harlan would you know Harlan's a, a nice guy I like Harlan he's a friend of mine but he he loves holding me up as an example because I was part of his group early on. There's a lot of people that were part of his group that didn't go anywhere. Uh, the majority of them didn't go anywhere. But what I did was uh, I was desperate enough to do what it took to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so that first year I made probably two hundred thousand dollars, one hundred eighty thousand dollars, something like that, which was a major mind trip at that point. Going from making thirty grand to making yeah. two hundred is weird. Um, that was actually a harder transition mentally than going from making a couple hundred grand a year as a copywriter to making a lot more as a business owner. Uh, making a lot more as a business owner didn't really affect me all that much except for to say, great, this is better. I like this yeah. better than the other option. Whereas the transition, I think it's, you know, we, we attach so much emotion to money. All of us do. Yeah. And for me, getting paid reasonably well after spending the first quarter of my life or more than a quarter of my life, being kind of a failure, being like the guy who was... If you're measuring it by money, is what you're saying. Not even, not even, no, not no. even money, because I wasn't, doing, I wasn't doing anything that really fulfilled me, and I wasn't successful in any in interesting way. Mm -hmm. I was always a guy who had a decent amount of talent, but didn't know how to express it. Yeah. And um, that held me back more than anything. And, you know, money is a fine measuring stick for things. I like making money. I don't do the work I do now for the money, particularly. I mean, beyond a certain threshold that it takes to keep the lights on. Yeah. Um, I do it because I find it really satisfying and enjoyable and creatively interesting. And who doesn't like being successful and being seen as successful? It's great. So what Speaking was one of those things that um, during that, obviously that transition, when you joined his mentoring program, you jumped from whatever it was, 28000 to 100000 200000 What were some yeah. of those um, kind of turning points that, that helped that? Well, partly it was just, you know, being exposed to stuff by like John Carlton and meeting David Garfinkel and having Harlan go over my first sales letter at uh, my, my Hat on Ink sales letter and rip it to shreds, basically, over and over again, brutally. You know, those guys took the stuff that I first wrote. I hired John at one point to look at something I wrote that I was really proud of, and he destroyed it in five minutes and told me exactly what was wrong with it. And my ego got battered badly. And uh, but I didn't let that kill me. You know, I came back and said, okay, well, this guy knows, I have respect for this guy. He knows mm -hmm. what he's doing. So I did that. I also, uh, you know, I, at the time, I remember I had like some friends who were like, I was working the phones a lot at that point, trying to get clients. I would literally open up the yellow pages and start calling people to try to and say, hey, I'm a copywriter. I do this, blah, blah, blah. And uh, finally got a few jobs out of that. It took me forever. Um, but tenacity, a lot of people say, oh, man, I could never work from home. I can't do that. I'm like, well, you know what? If you, if you have to come up with 600 bucks for rent by the end of the month and you have no idea how you're going to do it, you get off your ass. Right. Or, you go, or you can go broke. That's fine, too. You know? If you want to do that, you can do that. But I was desperate. Uh, I was desperate to keep the lights on. And I was desperate to prove to myself and to my brother and to the world that I was actually worth something at that point. Right? Because up until that point, I really had not ever had any real successes. Right? So that's uh, tough. Who was a big client that was a big turning point for you that you got? Uh, Jeff Paul was my very first big ticket client. Uh, Jeff Paul is a guy who used to do like how to make money in your underwear kind of stuff. He had uh, infomercials am, too, right? He did do infomercials. Yeah. Jeff is a fascinating guy. And I met Jeff at um, Big Seminar 5, I think it was. And I went there and I uh, Harlan had told me to like bring your business cards and just go around and put a business card in every freaking seat basically. And so I did. I went through that entire room and papered it with business cards. And afterwards, um, uh, uh, Armand got up on stage and was like, uh, please don't put your business cards on people's seats, blah, blah, blah. And they were mad. 
but I got my first couple clients out of that, right? Better to ask for permit, ask for forgiveness than permission, right? Because I, I didn't know. I was that was my first seminar of any kind that I went to, was that one, and I got introduced to Jeff Paul by Larry Benet, and uh, he saw some of my work and liked it, and he paid me ten thousand dollars to do a job which was amazing. I was like, oh my God, that's an insane amount of money. I actually had to get the work done really fast. I remember me and my girlfriend at the time went down to Portland for something and I was like sitting in the basement desperately writing copy while she was hanging out with her friends and her friend's kids. And I uh, got that one and then from there I ended up doing a lot of stuff in the real estate niche with a bunch of different guys and then I ended up getting introduced to um, people in the IM space and then I ended up meeting Jeff Walker at one point at a conference. I ended up doing some work with Jeff, doing product launches and stuff like that and just kind of kept going. And then suddenly near the end of my copywriting career, um, some of the guys that sell like uh, automatic software on ClickBank at the time found out that I was good at this stuff and I ended up getting a lot of those jobs in a row. And those jobs are actually what convinced me that being a freelancer is a really crappy, shitty way to make a living. Why? Um, because you're always you're still trading time for money. You don't have a business. I think chiropractors are the same way, by the way. Because as a chiropractor, you're selling the fact that you are going to be there every day physically, killing yourself to crack people's backs and help them get better. Yeah. It's any not professional a services. Any professional services. Yeah, trading your trading your time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, know, I know more chiropractors get hurt than their clients do at this point because they're, uh, it's all very physically demanding. But I remember I wrote one called uh, Mobile Money Machines for um, a client. And it was a good script. It was a lot of fun. It was funny. It was shocking. It was weird. It was about how to make you know, money in the mobile gold rush. It had a good topic to it that the idiots who buy those low-end uh, infomercial products uh, would, really, would really want. And I wrote that one, and it took off like a freaking firecracker, man. And I, I made a good money. They paid me twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000, something like that. A lot of money. And it only took me a couple of days to do it because I, I, I work fast when I work. I don't work a lot, but when I do, I work fast. And uh, it took off. I mean, they, it was making millions of dollars in sales. I don't know exactly how much it ended up making, but uh, I heard it made over $10 million in sales on that one product. Wow. And I called up my client. I said, wow. And he's like, yeah, it's doing amazing. It's like in ClickBank number one. It's got a 500 gravity. It's, you know, conversions are through the roof. EPCs are through the roof, all this other stuff. I said, that's awesome. Hey, you should send me a bonus, right? Yeah. And he said, yeah, yeah, I should send you a bonus. I should totally do that. And so I was like, great, I'm going to get a bonus. And I'm like, man, they've made millions of dollars. I wonder, and off of my letter, like, I wonder what that bonus is going to be. And I got the bonus and it was 5,000 bucks. And I remember looking at that 5,000 bucks and granted, if you had told me when I was 20 that I would look at a, a check for $5,000 and be disappointed, I would call you an idiot. But I was like, what? Really? $5,000 is the bonus when you've made millions off of what I did? And that was the last time I took a client, basically. I think I, I did a couple of jobs for existing clients to keep the lights on. That was, was just like, so painful to see that. and It just pissed me off, you know? And I was just like, this is stupid. And I'm like, you know what? These guys aren't smarter than me. These guys aren't harder working than me. And I've got the one thing you actually need to be successful in a direct response business. I've got copy that converts. So why am I doing this for other people? Mm -hmm. And you know, honestly, after I started my own business and got successful, successful, whatever the hell that means, um, I remember I, I know so many copywriters and they'll come up to me, all these baby copywriters and even people that have been in the business for years will come up to me at a conference and they're like, you escaped, you got out, right? And I even thought about at one point I was gonna do a coaching program for copywriters called the Escape Hatch, and it was gonna be about how to not be a freaking copywriter anymore for other people. I think working for clients is great for a couple of years to get your chops up, because yeah. you do a lot of work. My biggest regret in my career is that I spent, I think, six years as a freelance copywriter instead of three. Mm -hmm. I should have started my own products and honestly, man, if I'd started back then, it was, you know, back in like 2009 or something like that, when it was, things were still kind of hot at that point, yeah. it, was, it was easier to make money back then, right? So, it, I mean, that's my biggest regret in my entire career is that I spent all that time as a one-man operation, not having any employees or anything else, not doing my own stuff, yeah. and, cha and, and try working so hard to make other people rich. Yeah. Right? I want to hear, Chris, from you what when you decided that what you did next but i want to ask first i don't want to skip over the fact of that um campaign did really well what are some of the components yeah. we should emulate in that campaign that just you know killed it uh it had a it had a story it had a great storyline 
Um, the story was about a guy who like got hooked up with this underground black market kind of, you know, Catal that was that had secret access to all of the cell phones of the world and blah, blah, blah. Bullshit. By the way, all of those products that the automatic software that makes you money products don't work, amazingly enough. Uh, one of the reasons I stopped doing it is because I felt morally dirty for taking those clients. But at the same time, I needed the money. So. Um, but it had a really good storyline. You know, it had a passion. How'd you come up with that? Because that's not easy um, for everyone. It was a lot of brainstorming with the guys who actually owned the product mm-hmm. at that point. About, and, and a lot of looking at what had really been doing well in that market at that place mm-hmm. at that point. And at that point in history, um, the ClickBank marketplace for IM was an arms race of who could make the most ridiculous claims, who could have the most unbelievable storylines. And it seemed like the more unbelievable and crazier you got, the more money it made at that point. Um, so you just had to like really throw everything at the wall. And so we ended up doing that and putting it out there. I think that one did really well because it had a really good hook and had a really good storyline. Right? The hook was the mobile stuff, which was different than everything else. Mm-hmm. You don't just want to do what everything everybody else is doing. And then it had a really compelling, interesting, fun story. It really painted, it painted guys like uh, Frank Kern and Jeff Walker as the bad guy. Because I knew that that marketplace and the IM marketplace – a lot of the people that don't do anything firmly believe that the guys at the top are hiding the, the, the secrets of success. They firmly believe that all the stuff that Frank and Jeff and all these other guys teach is just a little bit of the mountain. And underneath it, there's all this other stuff that they don't tell you about. They believe that. You know what the real secret is? Do the fucking work. That's all it is. Just do it and don't right. let anybody tell you you can't do it. Those are the two things. Laziness and low self-esteem are what keep people from being successful. Right, because like oh, I can't do that. I'm uh, whatever. Just freaking do it. You know, uh, emulate before you innovate is the biggest thing. So yeah, and then I ended up uh, from there. I was like, I I'd already uh, created my text your wife into bed product, which was doing. You know, I, I made a couple thousand dollars a month off. So of you that. already created that at the time when that you got that painful bonus check. You had already yep. created the texting product. Yeah, the door was over, the first texting product. I have yeah. three texting products okay. actually. Um, yeah, the very first one I'd already created. Got that out the door. And it was doing okay. It wasn't doing amazing, but it was doing okay. And then from there, I ended up uh, speaking at Jeff Walker's event, and I'm pretty good on stage. And so afterwards, um, a PR lady named Amal Wagner came and said, hey, I want to work with you on something. And I said, what do you watch? She's like, well, you're really you know, charismatic and good on stage. I want to do something with you. And I'm like, well, what would that be? And I, I said, well, the only thing I have is this text your wife in the bed thing. She's like, I can't do that. It's too dirty. Can you create a cleaner version of that? And I said, like, what? And Megan, who uh, worked for me then and works for me now, said, we should call it, like, Text the Romance Back. And I'm like, okay. And so we actually created the website for Text the Romance Back and created a giveaway, a bribe called Three Magic Texts before we created the product, right? And we started putting out PR for that product before I'd written the product at that point. And we started getting all these phone calls from people saying, well, Text the Romance Back, what's that? Because it, it was right around Valentine's Day 2010. And so people were really, you know, it was a great time for that particular thing. And uh, we started getting all these phone calls. I started getting a phone call. And then we got a phone call from Rachel Ray, her producer, yeah. saying, hey, it's really interesting. Every, anyone can, should watch that. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's good, yeah. Yeah. And then so they said, can, can Michael come out and be on our Valentine's Day show? And, of course, we said yes. And they flew me out there. And I actually wrote the entire Text of the Romance Back product, the first draft of it anyway, uh, in two days right before getting on a plane to go there. Wow. It just burned it out, you know, and um, then went off to went off to there. And uh, what's the format for the product that you decided on? That one, it's just a. It's that one was an ebook, more or less, and okay. it was just. Uh, it was like I think um, eight or nine chapters, and each chapter is a different formula for a text and things mm-hmm. like that. I've okay. always found content creation relatively easy, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not that hard to figure out the format. You just got to when I when I teach people that write products for us now, the number one thing I have to teach them is make it as done for you as humanly possible. Don't make the person who bought the product do any thinking mm-hmm. and don't make them do any work because they won't do either. Mm-hmm. Right? And then, they'll, then they're going to refund because they're right. not going to be So it's not about, you know, you always, uh, you, you teach them the what and you, you sell them the how. And the how has to be, uh, like we have a new one that's an uh, online dating product we just put out. And, you know, the sales video is about uh, what men secretly see when they look at your online dating profile. Mm-hmm. Good hook, you know. And then the product is, here's what you should say instead. Easy. 
Easy peasy, right? Easiest thing in the world. And so many people try to make it way too complicated, right? They try to fuck up the formula in that way. Or they make their product about the what. They're like, you can, you know, online dating is awesome. I'm like, they don't care about that. They care about the result that you can actually get them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I did that. Sex the Romance uh, back did pretty well. That launched us into the women's market. And then from there, it was... Uh, a rocket for the next couple of years where we had uh, Texture, X, Texture X back came next because we had so many people buying Text the Romance back and saying, will this work on my X? And so I said, I guess I'll create this other product. And Texture X back very quickly became our number one product mm -hmm. and uh, is still in our top two or three as far as daily sales go. Uh, then from there, we created. I created some really funny male products that are a little too dirty to mention here. And then we did uh, more women's stuff. We ended up coming out with one called The Secret Survey that did $400,000 in its first week wow. in sales, which was amazing. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. That was a fun week. And then we did one called Capture His Heart, Make Him Love You Forever, which ended up doing uh, becoming the number four or five product on ClickBank at one point and doing really well. And that's actually a fun story um, about that one because I was really sick at the time. Um, like I had Lyme disease and all that other kind of stuff. And I really only had a couple hours a day that I was really functional. And I remember Megan had called me and said, hey, we really need the sales video script for Capture His Heart. And I said, okay. And we had somebody else write the product. And so I got to my desk and I was really tired. And I could barely focus, but I got through a script and I showed it to some people and they said, yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. And so we sent it off to be animated and we paid, you know, a bunch of money for somebody to animate it, that doodle and stuff. People yes, did. yes, yes. Yeah, and then uh, I went off to um, Yannick's event, Underground, whatever number it was, in DC. And we were finally testing the offer to our own list. And uh, my friend Mark Ling was testing it to his list, and our launch was the next week. We had all these affiliates that I'd been priming the pump with, saying, hey, we have a new product coming out. You know what happened with our last one. It's going to be awesome. And when we tested the offer, the conversions were not that good. Hmm. They were, you know, I think for our internal list, we were getting about 2%, which for my list, I want at least 6%, maybe more, um, to be happy with one of our internal offers. And then Mark was not doing particularly well either. He was like, ah, it's doing okay, but it wasn't to my standards. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, was in DC and I said, this is not good enough. And so my brain started spinning and I texted Megan, who was in DC with me, and I said, um, bring water and food, I'll meet you at my hotel room in half an hour. And I ran to Best Buy and bought a microphone because uh, I didn't have my microphone with me. And I went up to the uh, hotel room and Megan was there and I burned through a totally new script in about three hours. And the new script was a story script. You know, it was a script about, uh, hi, I'm Michael Fury. I'm going to teach you uh, the three simple steps to make a man fall desperately in love with you. And then I told the story of how I was kind of a player who was sleeping with a lot of girls. And then I met this one girl who changed everything and how now I'm, at the time I was engaged to her and that, I, that she had learned everything that she knew about landing a man like me from this other woman named Claire Casey. And I wrote that entire thing in almost no time. We got a bunch of images. We put together the slides put the video out, send it over to Dan on the West Coast, who's our, our guy there, who to put it up on the sales video, put out a new email to our list the next day, and we had an, a 400% conversion increase. Wow. 400%. And that offer became our best-selling offer ever, right? That offer did over a million dollars in sales within four months, I think. Wow. Something like that, by itself, $47 at a time, right? Uh, plus That's up remarkable, on. yeah. Yeah, it was really good. It was a pretty awesome thing. It set, the, it, it set the standard for what I consider successful kind of too high, I think, sometimes. But uh, either way, it did extraordinarily well. But it was like, man, I, and I remember like I've given speeches about this. I'm like, the freaking story is the most important thing if you yeah. have a compelling one. You know, the hook and the story are the most important thing. If you have a story that's going to resonate with that market, you should tell it. And you should tell, you should always tell the story that makes you the most uncomfortable to reveal, right? Um, so was that, what was the story for you that was most uncomfortable? I was telling all of these women who looked up to Michael Fury that Michael Fury was kind of a pickup artist at one point. Mm -hmm. right? That's uncomfortable. You know, admitting that is uncomfortable. Talking about that is uncomfortable. We did one recently called uh, Crack the Girl Code. And that story is largely about me being a dork in high school who couldn't get laid, you know, and just really being like, yeah, I was a skinny uh, you know, ADHD addled guy with no game who then figured it out and here's how and all that kind of stuff. And just telling the story that being makes you vulnerable. 
too. Being vulnerable, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, my wife gets a little mad at me sometimes. She's like, man, Chris, you're an open book. You'll tell anybody everything. And I say that's for two reasons. One, when you're open, uh, nobody can use anything against you because, hey, everybody already knows it. It's fine. And B, uh, it, it puts people at ease. You know, that's how we yeah. bond is by telling yeah. each other our stories and finding our common tragedy is really how you kind yeah. of bond with somebody. You know, um, humans are, are wired to find people who are similar to them in some way. So if you want to make a friend, you figure out what's similar about the yeah. two of you. What's like something on, your wife was surprised that you actually shared? Oh, man, I've talked about, um, you know, a lot of the stuff about uh, what's my like the, even the back, the back, the back stuff, uh, saying things about my family. I told a story at one point on stage about when I got arrested years ago. That was kind of fun. Um, all this other stuff that she could. That, but she's a very private person. You know, for there's a reason that I never mention her name or any details about her and all the stuff that Michael Fiore puts out because she's extremely private. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. which is funny that we got married because I'm not private at all. But, you know, opposites attract. Yeah. So, so, Chris, what did you do? So you went from zero to 400,000 in a week. Yep. So crazy. what were some of the big things that you did in that launch that other people should be doing? Um, the biggest thing was getting the affiliates really excited. Well, what, mm -hmm. there was two things. One, that the pro I always create the product based on a need. I don't create a product that I want to sell, mm -hmm. right? So you always look for what does the market want to know? Mm -hmm. And I had, we'd been surveying our list, and we get all these questions from uh, women saying things like, you know, why do men lie? Um, you know, why do, uh, why, why do guys watch porn? Uh, why, why do men look at, why do men look at other women when they have a girlfriend, right? They actually ask these questions to me. That seems very obvious because I'm a guy, but you know, they don't get it. <laughs> right. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to create a product that answers all these questions. And so we kind of calling it the secret survey because there was a survey component to it, all this other kinds of stuff. And we put that together. And then the actual sales video, uh, was live action. It was me on the screen talking. Um, for most of it, we had some really good animation, also the kind of stuff. Nobody was really doing that at the time. Everybody else was just doing uh, slides on the screen. Mm -hmm. And here's the deal with that kind of thing. You may or may not get a huge conversion increase from that, but what it did for us was it got affiliates who were bored out of their minds of sending to flat copy sales videos excited about promoting something because mm -hmm. it looks different, right? And then the copy actually converted because it was a major tease. There's actually no real story in that video. There's no real content in that video, by the way. Uh, most of my sales videos have a good amount of content and their stories and all those other kinds of things. There's honestly no content at all in that particular sales video. It's just, I want to teach you why men lie to women they love. And then it talks about... Um, the, the, the downside of that kind of thing. And then it tells the story of how I surveyed my men's list and what, what people revealed. And then it teases the hell out of them. And then it says, if you want in, here's the product. I will run it out. And it converts extraordinarily well still to this day. You know, whenever I mail to that thing, I make a lot of money off it. And so do our affiliates because it's got that big thing. It's got low refund rates, all that kind of thing. But it's just about making it exciting for people and not overestimating uh, or what your audience wants to know. You know, to me, the idea of women even asking why do guy, why do men look at women, other women, when they have a girlfriend or a wife, is absurd. Because I'm a guy, right? But that's where they're at. That's where the audience is at, right? That's where the people that want to buy these kind of products are at. So, before you had a track record, how did you get affiliates? Um. By the way, there's a little static on the mic, and I'll maybe move oh, it up sorry. a little bit. Yeah, is that better? Yeah, yeah. Um, I got affiliates originally, you know, actually it's a funny story. The first thing I ever did was I put out text your wife in a bed and I got introduced to a guy named Brad Costanza and Brad runs a group called the syndicate, which is this little like, uh, the dating syndicate basically. It's all these guys who can pick up products. And so they put me into that uh, group and invited me to that email group. And I said, well, that's wonderful. That's great. Thanks. And I introduced myself and I already had a reputation as a copywriter at that point. And so all I did was I started offering uh, to do phone calls with people about copy. And I said, hey, you know what? I'm really happy to be in the group. Um, I'm just going to offer to do some free copy critiques for people. I'm not going to write your copy for you because I don't have time for that, but I'll, I'll do some critiques and I'll give you some advice. And I just started giving what I had to give at that point. And then very quickly, people were like, oh, man, well, you've got some products. Let me try it out. And my stuff converted. And once you, once you get a converting offer, it's easy, right? If you have stuff that actually converts, that has low refund rates, and that the audience that you're mailing to doesn't complain about, it's actually easy to get traffic, right? If I went back to the IM niche and I went to um, you know, Jeff Walker or any of these guys who I've met over the years, and I said, hey, I've got a, a product that's really a good fit for your list, they would mail it because they want to make money. 
Like, it's not like people are like, you know, standing here saying you're not allowed in. Um, people that have lists are always looking for good high converting offers, yeah. right? The, the, the problem is most people don't have a high converting offer. They yeah. have an offer that barely converts at all. So um, the standards are just so different at that point. And they get all mad because they're like, none of these guys will mail my stuff. I'm like, you don't know how to make money. Right. So why would they mail your stuff? Right. Do you prove it out first with paid ads or how do you, you know, because obviously you're well, sending your own. Yeah, at that time we didn't. Um, we do now. Um, where we finally have the infrastructure where we do a lot more paid advertising. And what we normally do with a new offer is we'll run Chris, it to our. Do me a, just uh, plug the headset in and out for, uh, for a second or it's, it's still a little staticky for some reason. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Oops. If I could find the plug. Oh, there it is. Let's see. Is that any better? Say again. Is that any better? A little bit, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I was talking to a friend recently, a good friend of mine who I've known for years. He was actually in the dating relationship space years before I was. We met at Mass Control years ago. And he called me up and he said, hey, I've got a new offer. It's a, um, something that's really going to do well. Can you mail it for me? And I was like, oh, man, I don't know. And he's like, well, why not? I'm like, listen, you're a good friend of mine. I'm not going to say his name for a reason. but That's okay, yeah. Yeah, you're a good friend of mine, but you don't have a track record for actually making anybody any money. And he said, well, Chris, you know, I work really hard on this. I've done similar things in the past. It's a webinar model kind of stuff. I know what I'm doing. Send me some traffic, and I will make you money. And I said, man, I don't know about this, but okay. And I sent him probably 10,000 clicks over a couple of emails. He got a lot of people to opt into his list for the webinar. And I made less money on that promo than anything I've mailed in the last two years. Hmm. Right? And it pissed me off. And it didn't piss me off because I didn't make any money. Right? The money was annoying because, you know, we have certain benchmarks we try to hit every month. But we have plenty in the bank as far as the business goes. You know, we make more than we need, which is the, the key to happiness, by the way. Um, it pissed me off because I knew that I was never going to be be able to let myself mail anything of his again, right? And also because of the way he handled it afterwards. I wrote him a long email at one point and I said, if I were in your, sh like a week later when he hadn't done any of this stuff, I said, here's what I would have done if I were in your shoes. And I said, I would have called each of your top 10 affiliates personally, instead of sending out one really brief email saying you had a tech glitch. I would have said, yes, there was a tech glitch, but this is my, this is still my fault. I would take ownership of it. Right, because if you don't take ownership, then nobody trusts you ever again. Right, and personally, what I would have done if I could afford it at that point is I would have cut a check to each of my top ten affiliates, getting them to what they what they minimally want to make on a mailing. Right, because if you don't have your affiliate relationships and your reputation, you don't have anything right. in this industry. And I told him, I was like, dude, you don't even understand the damage you did to yourself in this business. Right? Unless you're somebody that really gets paid advertising, which is way harder than affiliate stuff, then you need affiliates. Yeah. And if you go right out, again, it's not about failure. I've had things that I've had affiliates know before that didn't do that well, but I've made it right for them yeah. afterwards. You know, Mark Ling is one of my best affiliates, and I'm one of his best affiliates. I messed up at one point and mailed an offer to his, one of his offers without my affiliate link. Right? He cut me a check. For that you think i'm going to mail everything he has from now on right. even, even though his stuff only converts okay yeah right or this other guy like he didn't do any of that stuff and i was like he got and he was like man why are you being so mean to me i'm like because i i care that's why i'm being yeah. mean to you. because i care about the it's not about me being disrespected though that bothered me it was about man you don't understand that you've hurt yourself yeah. in this business and you understand that the next like this was his first women's product i'm not going to mail a second one Right. right. I just, I can't do it. Like I, unless like unless he comes to me with a lot of metrics that show that he knows what he's doing at that point. Because uh, you know I got somebody else who said, "Oh, just mail my offer. It's free money." I'm like, "It's not free money for me to do an email." Every time I do an email, I lose several hundred subscribers. Yeah. Right. Um, it's you your know, reputation on the line. It's every your time reputation. You yeah. Everything is your reputation on the line. And so it just really bothers me when people don't understand that and don't. And I also try. I really try to treat people that I do business with in a very positive way I, like I always say the number one job in our business is to make our affiliates money like if we make our affiliates money we'll make money too we'll yeah. do great right 
And so when people don't have that attitude, it really bothers me. Like, I don't understand it, right? It's like, I don't, why wouldn't you treat, and I'm like, well, I'm kind of a big deal in this niche now. Why would you want to make me angry? That seems weird. I wouldn't want to do that. That doesn't make any sense. Well, that's strange. Yeah. So that's what, that's what kind of gets me where we are now. Um, but yeah, now, I mean, I've had this business for four years. I haven't taken a client in pretty much that entire time. Um, I'm happier. Not so taking- Chris, what are some of your favorite headlines? I always like to... Let's see. My favorite headlines that I've written or just in general? Uh, that you've written or in general? Um, well, favorite and most effective isn't always the best same thing. But my favorite was for a letter I wrote for Joe Barton years ago, uh, who said the alternative, alternative health niche. And it said something to the lines of how to have the how to have the stiff throbbing, stiff throbbing, almost too hard math class boners you had when you were a teenager naturally and without drugs, right? And it was, and that story was like the storyline in that that sales letter was all about like you know when you're like 16 years old and you get a hard on from anything. Like, and you're sitting in math class, and you don't even know why you have an erection because you're sitting there in math class. And then the bell rings, and you're like, shit, what am I going to do? And you have to, like, <laughs> you take your math book and you put it in front of you, and you're like, oh my God, that's so embarrassing. If they notice, what's going to happen? And you go out from there. And I use that as kind of a, a storyline, hope to get people in. Because most guys kind of remember that, right? Yeah. And that was like an erectile dysfunction product that did pretty well. Yeah. Other stuff, you know, headlines are, I'm, honestly, I would say headlines are not my biggest strong suit as a writer. Yeah. Um, I do good headlines, we find functional ones. It's often yeah. ones that are quite boring, though, that end up being the most effective. You know, for mm-hmm. Capture His Heart, which is at CaptureHim.com, we've tested dozens of headlines. And the one that has always done the best is Three Steps to Make a Man Love You. Simple benefit oriented headline, no storyline, right? Um, my favorite headlines of all time tend to be John Carlton ones, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the, the one like a golfer stuff, things like that. But I often find that um, in the modern IM world, when you're doing sales videos, and sales videos are different than sales letters in the way they're presented, the way they're constructed, the, what they're meant to be is different. Um, relatively simple benefit oriented stuff works pretty well, yeah. right? Uh, getting too complicated, you might get somebody's attention for a brief amount of time, but generally speaking, it's about putting, pushing that benefit as much as you can. And then if you can, mix in the doctor thing. Yeah, I was on the phone with somebody who was, um, I still do consulting for people, and I had somebody who was in the dating niche, and they had a letter that was doing okay, and they, he was talking for a while, and then he said, oh, yeah, it was discovered by this Asian doctor, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, dude, here's your hook. And it ended up being, you know, Asian doctor's secret for hypnotizing women who want to sleep with you, or something like that. Right. And then he changed, they changed all their banners and stuff like that, and all of a sudden it was profitable, right? Because it had that kind of, like, that mechanism to it. Right. right? I'm big on mechanisms. You know, text your ex back, text the romance back. They're just mechan- mechanisms, you know, texting. Is kind of the mechanism that I hung my hat on. And the reason Text Your Ex Back did so well was because it wasn't just how to get your ex back. It was how to get your ex back by using tiny little text messages from the cell phone or per- cell phone you've got in your pocket or purse right now. Yeah. Right? yeah. And Chris, you mentioned too, obviously, in all you talk about the importance of story. What are some yeah. of the components you use to craft, craft the story? I'm always looking for... Well, I, I use a lot of my own personal stuff, generally speaking, because I just I'm, I'm always I'm always telling stories. I got all excited the other day. I'll tell a quick story now. That's kind of an example of how like, what how what gets me excited. I was uh, down in Pioneer Square here in Seattle. I was going to a friend's house to watch a movie with a bunch of folks, um, and I'm driving in my, my car, and I'm trying to find parking. I just woke up from a nap. I'm kind of tired. I'm a little annoyed at that point that it's like uh, late, and I look in my rearview mirror and I see a police car in my rearview mirror. And I'm like, that's weird. There's a cop behind me. Okay. And then I just like keep driving and I'm looking for parking. And I take a right and the cop takes a right too. And I go, yeah, cop is still behind me. I'm like, is my tail light out? What's going on? I take another right. I see a parking space. I pull into the parking space. And I'm sitting there and I want to straighten out my car, but I can't because there's a cop right there. I can't straighten out my car. And eventually the cop pulls up next to me and he rolls down his window. And he's this young, good looking cop. And I go, hey, what's up? And he goes, hi. Um, somebody thought you stole that car. And I go, really? Like somebody called it in? Somebody reported that I stole this car? That's a Subaru Outback, right? It's just like a nothing particularly strange. And he goes, yeah. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. And he goes, yeah, it wasn't you though. I'm like, I know it wasn't me. I bought this car. I'm well aware that it, 
I'm well aware that it wasn't me, right? And then he ends up driving on, and I see there was another cop car right behind him. And they're actually, they thought I was a criminal who had stolen this car, and they were ready to draw their guns and, like, you know, whatever else. And my disappointment after that was, hey, that's a fun little story. But, man, it would have been so much better of a story if they put me in handcuffs. Right. Right? It would have been so much better of a story if they drew their guns and told me to get out of the car and put me in handcuffs and, that, and then found out that I wasn't a thief. And that's like, because that's, that's the story that you want to be able to tell is the dramatic one, right? And so when I'm looking for stories, I'm always trying to think, to, to tell in a, um, a business context, I'm always looking for something that is a very specific story that has a lot of detail that can inspire someone to feel like it could be them too, Right? Like when I wrote the story for the Crack the Girl Code product, I give a lot of very specific detail about my own experience being a guy who can't get girls. And most guys didn't grow up in Grafton, Massachusetts. Most guys didn't have that specific experience. I tell a story about giving a hug to a coworker and like pretending it was a fake hug, but actually making it a real hug because I hadn't hugged anybody in six months at that point after I moved to LA and all that kind of stuff. Most people don't have that specific experience, but they can, they can empathize with it in a way, right? The mistake people make is they try to tell stories that are really broad. They try to tell stories that are, this could appeal to- All encompassing. Everyone. I'm exactly like you. That doesn't work. Specifics are what work. You know, specifics and character are what work. Yeah. Right? Um, you want to be able to, you know, you want those core components about, you know, defeating adversity or things like that. Um, Michael, the Michael Flory stuff, you get on the Checks the Romance Back email list. The third email I send, I think, is the why I do this email. And that one email gets more responses than anything I've ever written to my list. Hmm. And we still, every day we get emails from people saying, wow, let me tell you my story too. And that email is about me being four years old, lying in bed, hearing my parents screaming at each other in the kitchen. And I walk out to the kitchen and I yell at them to be quiet so I can get some sleep. Right? Very specific story, but, yeah. people, but it pulls that heartstring it and does, yeah. waves where they say, and I, and I say, the reason I do this is I don't want any other kid in the world to have to live like that, to have to live with people who hate, hate themselves, mm. hate each other. And that story gets a lot of resonance in a way that just saying yeah. things never does. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Chris, I appreciate your time. I know um, you have to go. Yep. So I have one last question. Uh, um, before I ask it, will you tell people where they can find out more about you? What's, what's going on lately? You. Yeah, you can't you can't find out much about much about Chris Haddad because I don't really. Uh, it's funny people are always saying like, oh, you should be doing IM products and things like that. But I just have no interest in it. I don't have a lot of interest in. Uh, I don't want to have to write the copy that I know works at IM, basically. Because mm -hmm. what you have to, to to make it work in IM, it has to be all ridiculous income claims and all sort of kind of crap. And I'm just not interested in doing it. I, I'll tell the truth about what we do easily, and people get weirded out when you tell the truth, by the way, too, because they th and I am everyone assumes you're lying, and then when they're like, "Oh, you actually you're the one guy who wasn't lying," and they're like, "Oh wait, what's going on?" I had a friend of mine. Was, I was in Australia, and they were, were talk, trading uh, business stories. He's very successful as well, and he's like, "I tell him how we're doing and what I you know did last year and such." And he's like, "Really, mate? Nobody does that." I'm like, uh, "Oh, I thought everyone else was doing better than me. How strange." Because I think everybody does that. You always assume everyone else is up here, no matter how high you go. Right. And when you find out they're not, you're like, how confusing. I don't really understand. What was the genome? Uh, but anyway, if you want to like learn more about our business, the best way to do that is to go to digitalromanceinc.com. Okay. So digitalromanceinc.com. That's yeah. our main hub website for all of our stuff. Uh, beyond that, like, I don't really put out a lot of marketing stuff. So yeah. it's not really my thing. Uh, actually, if you get on our affiliate list, you'll get some good stuff from me. So if you go to, um, if you go to digitalromanceinc.com and click on affiliates, it'll bring you to the affiliate site and you can get on our email list there and then you'll get, you'll see how I kind of get people excited about promoting our products and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Chris, so out of all of these, you know, ups and down journey, what's been the proudest yeah. moment for you? <clears throat> um, You've been through some enough, crap, let's be honest. I've been through a lot of crap. Yeah. Honestly, weirdly enough, the, 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 my, one of the happiest moments in my life was actually before any of this happened. And it was when I wrote, a, I was in this thing called 1448, the World's Quickest Theater Festival, and I got asked to write for it. And I wrote a play called Five Guys, which is a really funny play about five straight guys going to see Black Back Mountain. And, um, and ending up dancing at a gay club and things like that. And I wrote that and ended up being part of the festival. It was a 10 minute show and it went really, really well. And the entire audience is laughing and they were really happy. And that was one of my proudest moments ever. Just thinking, being like, wow, I wrote that. And that was the first time I did that particular kind of thing and it did really well. Beyond that, um, I think my proudest moment was just when I got to start turning down clients yeah. more than anything else, right? 
Um, What's the best part now about the success you've achieved in business? I get to play a lot of drums. You know, I get to, I mean, I have, um, I work hard for, you know, X number of hours a day. I get to, a couple things. One is it frees me up to be able to do what I really want to do with my time, right? Because that's fun, um, which is mostly sit in my basement and practice drums because I really like doing that. Um, and two, I get to hire people and help them develop in ways they never thought they could. I get to take people who have only ever seen work as something you hate doing but are forced to do yeah. and show them that you can have a job that you love. Yeah. And like people that work for us in our business really like working for us. And they do great work and give them a lot of freedom. And then you have to, you have to perform. If you don't perform, you're out. But if you're somebody who has, is uh, self-autonomous and can really do some stuff, they'll do really, really well. But right now, I just enjoy, um, I just enjoy being able to help other people do it. I enjoy uh, not having to worry about getting a client the next day, that kind of thing. And I enjoy being able to do more creative stuff. I'm not somebody who wants to buy a mansion. I'm not somebody who wants to buy a Ferrari. I'm not like, I, if people ask me what my dream car is, and I say my dream car is a 2013 Subaru Outback. Right. Because it's got a lot of room for drums. Like, what do, you, what do you mean? I'm not somebody who gets, I mean, I still wear the same Banana Republic t-shirts I ever did, right? So it's, um, money to me is, freedom and that's all it is yeah. right it's you know it's it's convenience it's like you know i mean i think i've only flown first class twice in my entire life to this day i still feel guilty even thinking about that sometimes right yeah. unless it's on miles or whatever else um so to me it's all about just like the opportunity and also uh, and being able to mentor people is really nice being having yeah. people who are like looking at things saying hey how do i do this and trying to i'll help you out right. i'll tell you what i can um and you tell people and the, the thing you have to learn though when you get to a certain level is You'll have tons of people asking for help, and you'll have very few people that are willing to pull themselves up to put your hand out, right? So the vast majority of people will say, what do I do? And you say, okay, well, go do this, this, and this, and they never do it, ever, right? And then you get the few people... That's that frustrating do. as a mentor. You know, you spend the time and energy, and you want them to actually improve. Yep. Yeah. But you just but you get to the point that you just don't. And I talked to you know, Garfinkel and other guys who mentored me about that, and they were like, Chris, now what we saw on you was... When I told you to do something, you did it. Yeah. And that seems so simple, but it's step one. Right. You know, it's step one. Did you do what you were told to do? Or did you give somebody back talk? Did you like say, well, I want to do it this way instead? Did you let your ego get in the way? Did you let any of that kind of stuff get in the way? I don't like think I'm particularly special. I just did the freaking work. Yeah. Right. And now I will do whatever I need to to stay at the level we're at or try to go higher because it's fun. Yeah. Right, as opposed to, um, yeah, I'm not. I, guess I really feel like if, uh, if copywriters, or whoever else, are kind of watching this, or whoever else, you know, even if you are somebody who is happy working for clients, you need your own products on the side. Yeah, because you will make. What do you think holds people, a copywriters, back from that? Because I always think about that. Well, they're, you know, they're amazing at converting other people's. Why not create their own? What holds people back? They're afraid of well, a couple of things. One, um, a lot of copywriters are kind of antisocial and afraid of being the center of attention. Or I'm not. I'm very comfortable on stage. Always have been. I used to act a lot in, yeah. in plays and things when I was younger. So getting up on stage in front of 600 people isn't that big of a deal to me, right? Um, the Ray, even the Rachel Ray thing, I was certainly. I would have been nervous out of my. Yeah, I would have been. So yeah, nervous. no, I was nervous. Uh, I, my thing is, I only get nervous one minute before something starts mm -hmm. i get insanely nervous until i walk out on stage and say something yeah and usually i'll open with some kind of inappropriate joke i'll make sure i get the audience going from there and then it's easy right, right. and then you just you just then you're off to the races you just have a good time it's fun yeah. um i treat my my marketing speeches like stand-up comedy routines anyway i just get to tell jokes the entire time while teaching people things it's kind of fun uh what holds them back is they think they're not allowed to and they think it's way more complicated than it actually is. It goes is. back to your advice of you don't need permission to be successful. You don't need permission to be successful. Yeah. Um, and it goes, like, when I started this, I didn't know what EPC even meant. I didn't know how to work an email list. By the way, starting my own business made me way better of a copywriter. Way better. Of a, I'm a way better copywriter now than I was when I was working with clients. Because I put something up and it's my money on the line. Yeah. And, and I get to log into the stats, you know, the day I mail it and see exactly how it's doing. Yeah. And I get to look at when people are dropping off the sales video and I get to look at all this stuff. Mm. And I know whether it's working or not. I get to like really see how the business works. Yeah. And um, I tell people like if you have your own products and know the business that way, you will make more money as a freelancer. Yeah. 
right? You'll be able to raise your rates because you can talk to these people on an even level. And more importantly, you can tell people to fuck off, right? right? And from a negotiating standpoint- You're empowered, yeah. yeah from a negotiating standpoint, but, you know, I've had, I, yeah, I've had people call me up in the last four years and say, well, give me so much money to write a sales letter. And I say, I'm not interested. And they say, well, well, well what do you mean? I'm like, I don't need that. Like, there's no, it's, it sounds like an annoying, it's like, I, I, as I tell them, I'm like, it sounds kind of annoying, and I don't think I want to help you get rich. Like, I don't, I don't, <laughs> like, I don't like you enough to want to help you get rich. Yeah. You're kind of a dick. So, and I've had people who are like pretty big, well-known gurus call me up and ask me to do stuff with them. I'm like, no, I don't think I'm going to. No, it's cool. So that's kind of fun. That's, that's probably my favorite thing about um, making it, quote unquote, yeah. whatever this means. My least favorite thing is, and this, this is true of everybody who gets to a point of success, mm -hmm. is it's, it's hard to keep yourself from being anxious about losing it all. Really? Right? Yeah. And uh, my brother actually asked me, he's like, you've made a good amount of money now. Why do you keep doing this? And my answer is, well, two things. One, winter is coming. You know, as they say in Game of Thrones, winter is coming. Yeah. Um, nothing lasts forever. You know, uh, sock away your money while you can. You're going to have to adapt and do other things. And also, like, I mean, I really enjoy my job, but also it's like there's that anxiety about uh, it's, it can all go away. You know, like nobody you hit That fuels you in a way. It fires you, be, fires you up because if you're thinking you know, it's going to go away, then just you keep wanting to do more? Well, I have, I have the most fun when I'm losing at poker, right? Like, we, I have, we have a weekly poker game with a bunch of friends of mine here in Seattle. It's like a $20 buy-in. I'm a really crappy poker player when I'm winning, and I'm a great poker player when I start losing, right? And what usually happens the nights that I win poker is we start off, I do okay for a while, uh, either luck goes against me or I make a bad play, I lose 90% of my chips, and then I'll go way up from there. Just because you get disciplined or what? Because you get that, that hunger again. you back against the wall. Yeah, back against the wall. And you're like, you do whatever you have to to go for it. You're willing to take risks. You're willing to do all this other stuff. And it's way too easy. You know, when we came into this niche, um, we kind of became the 800-pound gorilla in the room very, very quickly. Because I was, our team was much more aggressive. Because everybody else in the niche, all they were doing was ripping off Evan Hayden. Like, literally, every sales letter you saw was a swipe with an Evan Pagan sales letter, which I don't even think Evan Pagan sales letters are particularly good, honestly. Uh, so we did something totally different and became way more successful because we were aggressive, because we were hungry. Yeah. And we took and we took a pretty big part of the market. Hmm. And what I have to do now, as we are, are already established, is keep pushing things forward and not get into a point of complacency. I've met so many of these guys, like the old real estate guys who have been doing this for 20 years, running seminars, and they don't want to do it. Like they're just so burned out. Right, and they don't care anymore, and that's why they're not making any money anymore. So, keeping yourself from burnout, getting good people working with you, all that other kind of stuff, I think is the most important thing. And also, it's like I also don't think that um, people have this weird idea in America, particularly, that happiness comes from idleness. They're like, you know, you ask most people if you had a million dollars, what would you do? And they'll say, man, I'd quit my job and I would just like sit on a beach and sit, sit on a beach. Yeah. And, if I'm sitting on a beach for a week, I'm sitting my wrists. Yeah. I'm like, this is, this is boring. Like, yeah. you, know, you give me something interesting yeah. to do at it. That's fun. But just like, you know, my wife and I, uh, somebody at some charity thing, we got like a week in Mexico at some villa or something like that. And she's like, oh, we should go down. We'll bring some friends. I'm like, what is there to do there? It's like, well, you can sit on the beach. I'm like, I'm going to stay home. Bring your mom. <laughs> like, uh, like sitting, like I have no interest in that whatsoever. There's no drums there. There's nothing. Like, I, don't, I don't get it. It's not fun. So what's your so, favorite song to drum? Oh man, anything by James Brown is really fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. I really like doing funk stuff, and uh, I write a lot of songs these days. I write a lot of song lyrics, and then I'll, my buddy Mike and I work it out. I play guitar a little bit too, so we'll work out that way, and then uh, whatnot. But I, I love playing funk, and I love playing long to uh, like I love playing drum and bass kind of stuff. Yeah, I've only been playing drums for like two years, right? It's kind of a newer thing, but I've gotten pretty good at it because I put the time, because I do the work. Right. Like here's here's the secret to success, by the way. Do the work. Every day, yeah. do the work. Easier said than done, right? No, I get it. Dude, I get it. Yeah. But it's like, that's what you do. You wake yeah. up every day and you spend an hour doing the work. Yeah. And then eventually you get where you're going. There's no there's no fast way to do it. There's no yeah. like, like, people say, oh, you're an overnight success in this way. I'm like, no, I wasn't. Here's the seven years of work that got me there. Yeah. You know? So it just bugs me, um, that kind of thing. But yeah, I really like playing funk. I really like playing drum and bass. I like playing kind of stuttery electronica type stuff. That's fun. Right. Yeah.
Like Chris, time. I appreciate your time. Very <laughs> generous of you to spend it with me. I could probably no talk to you for the next few hours. I know you have to go. So, yeah, um, stories. Yeah. It, um, thank you so much. And I will email you as soon as it's live. Okay, and uh, I want to see a YouTube video of you playing drums. Uh, that will happen. I have to set it up so it sounds good. I'll, I'll do that at some okay. point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again, Chris. See you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.